everyone. Welcome to our session. We will be giving a intro and deep dive of the Kubernetes 6 storage. My name is Xin Yang. I work at VMware by Broadcom. Uh, I'm Hemant. I work for Red Hat on uh, OCP core storage. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I work at Google. Here's today's agenda. We will talk about what is uh, SIG storage, what we did in 1.30 and 1.31 release, what we're working on in 1.32, and finally, how to get involved. In SIG storage, Saad and myself are co-chairs, Michelle and Yang are tech leads. Other than the leads, we also have many other contributors. We have more than 6,000 members on the SIG storage Slack channel, and we have about 30 unique approvers for SIG-owned packages. What we do in SIG storage is defined in our charter. SIG storage is a special interest group that focuses on how to provide storage to containers running in Kubernetes. The terminologies that you heard most in SIG storage are probably person volume claims, person volumes, and storage classes. Person volume is the type of storage that lives beyond a pod's life cycle that allows us to support running databases in Kubernetes. A PVC is in the user namespace. It represents a user's request for storage. A PV is in the cluster scope. It represents a resource on the storage system. A PVC and a PV have a one-to-one -one mapping to each other. A storage class uh, defines the classes of storage that is defined by the admin. Different storage classes can map to different quality of service levels or other policies defined by the admin. In uh, dynamic provisioning, storage class can be used to decide what type of uh, provisioning to use and what parameters to pass to the provisioner to create a volume. We also support ephemeral volumes. An ephemeral volume becomes available when the pod uh, becomes available and then goes away when the pod goes down. Local ephemeral storage, such as empty dirt, can be used as a scratch space for the pod. We also have secrets that can be used to uh, store sensitive information. We have config maps that can be used to inject config data into the pods. Uh, we have uh, CSI ephemeral volumes that require a special CSI driver, such as the secret store CSI driver. And we have generic ephemeral volumes that allow any plugin that supports dynamic provisioning to be used as an ephemeral volume and have its lifecycle bound to a pod. And in 1.31 release, there is a new volume type called image that allows a container image file or artifacts to be mounted into the pod. Kubernetes volume plugins include in-tree plugins and auto-tree CSI drivers. Most CSI drivers, uh, most in-tree plugins are already deprecated or migrated to CSI drivers. We still have uh, some in-tree drivers. We have NFS, iSCSI, FC uh, volume plugins. They can be pre-populated pre with data and it can be used by the pod. We also have local volume, representing a mounted local storage device that can be used by a pod. Container storage interface CSI, uh, that sp uh, defines the common interfaces for a storage vendor to write a driver and have its underlying storage to be consumed by the containers running in Kubernetes. And CSI is the recommended way to write plugins. So that's a quick intro. Now let me hand it over to Michelle, who will talk about what we did in 1.30 release. Okay, thank you. All right. 
Yeah, so in 1.30, we promoted a couple of features to GA. Um, first, we redesigned the way that volume reconstruction works. Um, if you're unfamiliar with what volume reconstruction is, it's a feature that um, is needed to support kubelet restarting. When kubelet restarts, we lose all of the in-memory state we have about what volumes are mounted and to what pots. Um, we have to reconstruct that state um, by scanning all of the mount points and volume metadata that we keep in the nodes file system. And so we completely redesigned this feature to fix a number of bugs and make it more reliable. So in 1.30 timeframe, I think um, you'll find that scenarios where a kubelet restarts or crashes, um, we'll be able to recover from that more gracefully. Um, another feature that we GA'd was to control who can change the volume mode when restoring from a volume snapshot. So while most workloads interface at the file system level, backup software commonly has optimizations um, for backing up data at the block level. So to do this in a Kubernetes environment, the backup software has to be able to create a, a temporary block PVC from a file system volume snapshot. Um, so we want to allow backup software to be able to do this kind of operation, but we want to prevent most other users from being able to do this because um, there, are, there were previous security vulnerabilities in the file system layer, and so we want to protect um, users from being able to exploit that. And so this feature makes it possible so that or it basically requires that somebody with administrator privileges has to opt in to allow these snapshots to um, basically be uh, have their mode converted when we restore. And so, um, and so this is a potential behavior change. Um, if any of your applications used to rely on this kind of workflow, um, you now have to opt in at the administrator level to be able to um, allow this behavior. Um, but otherwise, if you're you know, doing a typical snapshot restore flow where your um, you know, snapshot is taken from a file system and you're just restoring it to a file system PVC, then you're fine and there's nothing you need to do there. Um, also in 1.30, we introduced a new alpha feature to improve performance for SC Linux relabeling. Um, so this is relevant if you're using an operating system with SC Linux enabled. Um, I think that's mostly uh, Red Hat distributions, but I believe other Linux distributions also support it as well. Um, before this feature, we would recursively walk through every file in a volume to properly set the SC Linux label on it. And so if your volume has a lot of files in it, this could take a really long time. It could take hours, potentially, if you have a very big volume. So now with this feature, we'll use a, a Linux mount option called context, um, which applies this mapping a lot faster. Um, in order to use it, there's a couple of criteria that needs to be met. Um, first, the CSI driver needs to declare that it supports mounting with this context mount option. Um, in addition, the workload needs to provision the PVC using the read write once pod access mode. Um, this allows us to turn it on by default because we know um, the read write once pod mode is uh, safe and won't break workloads. Um, but if you do want to enable it for any volume, um, you have to explicitly turn on this SE Linux mount feature gate. Um, but it does have the potential to break workloads that share volumes. And so this should be done in a test or staging environment first. Um, we're also adding additional documentation to detail all of the steps and um, how you can detect if your workload is compatible um, and, and how to resolve it if it's not. So if you're using an environment with SE Linux, um, be on the lookout for this. Uh, moving on to 131, one of the main features that we promoted to beta is the ability to modify existing volumes. 
So this is to support use cases like tuning performance parameters on PVCs after they're created. How it works is we've added a new object called volume attributes class. It's similar in concept to a storage class. However, the biggest difference is that storage class is only used for dynamic provisioning, whereas um, you can actually change the volume attributes class after a PVC has been created. And so there's a new field in the PVC object now called volume attributes class name. Um, you can change it after it's been created and uh, the CSI driver will actually go and change the underlying volume to the new class. Um, to go through, to walk through an example here. Um, here we have two volume attributes classes, one called silver, one called gold. So silver, you can specify your IOPS um, to 5,000, and gold will set it to 10,000. The PVC is initially provisioned with silver, but after some time, you realize that you need to allocate more performance to this workload. Um, so then what you just do is you modify your existing PVC object and change the volume attributes class to gold. And that will um, signal to the CSI driver to go ahead and actually um, change the underlying storage volume to, have, to allocate 10K IOPS to it. Um, so this feature has to be supported by the CSI driver you're using. Um, if this is interesting to you, please check your CSI driver's documentation for more details on how to use the feature and exactly what parameters um, your CSI driver supports. Um, another feature we promote at the beta is to support um, the PV reclaim policy regardless of the uh, object deletion ordering. So in the past, you've always had to delete the PVC object first and then allow the driver to then clean up the PV object. Um, if you did it in reverse and you deleted the PV object first, then it would not actually trigger deletion of the underlying storage system. And so this feature basically adds a finalizer. Um, so if you delete the PV object first, we will actually wait and um, wait for the PV object to be deleted and go through the proper deletion flow so that everything will get cleaned up properly. And lastly, um, we promoted to GA a feature to la add a last phase transition timestamp to the PV object. Um, whenever the PV changes the phase, such as when it goes from available to bound or bound to released, um, then we'll also record the timestamp of when that transition occurred. So this is mainly useful for metrics and also observability of the persistent volumes. Um, so yeah, now I'll hand it over to Mott to talk about our more recent features. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, what we did in 132 and what we're working towards in next releases. Uh, so one of the features that we are working in 132 is uh, change block tracking. And uh, what that allows is, is a vendor agnostic backup and snapshotting service <coughs> via change block tracking. The idea is a driver advertises this capability, which would expose the gRPC survey that will allow tracking of blocks that had changed, and it allows incremental backups and other services. So as part of this feature, we are uh, releasing a sidecar called Snapshot Metadata Sidecar, which will expose a TLS GR, uh, gRPC service on which the, the backup vendor will is supposed to listen and get the uh, change blocks. and this way, you can do the uh, incremental backups, basically. And uh, we have been working on uh, container object storage interface for a while now. It's still in alpha. And uh, and then we have been working on volume health. It's a feature in, in the CSI driver that can expose like whether it is working normal, abnormal. So we are, it's currently exposed as matrix. So we want to evaluate, get feedback, and see where how to make this feature more useful for users. So uh, one of the other features that we are moving to beta in 132 is recover from resize failure. So if you have used volume expansion, you might have seen that if you expand the size to too big of a value somehow, 
I don't know, accidentally or, or the storage provider doesn't have enough size available, it just gets stuck. There's no way to recover from that. There's a manual process, but it's, it's pretty lengthy. So uh, having this feature will allow you to reduce the volume size and retry volume expansion. And and it also exposes the resize status at a more granular level. You can see it, uh, the status of PVC in which state the resize operation is. And because of these extra states that are available to us, it fixes many long-standing bugs and risk conditions which were previously hard to fix. So it's more, it should be more robust in 132. And uh, as Michelle said, we have been continuously working on improving SLNX relabeling, which is time consuming. It was done by container runtime. It used to time out. It was pretty expensive. So it's default in 131 for, for read write once parts, but we are working to make it default for all volume types. And uh, <clears throat> what we have, what we are doing is we have introduced this new feature grid called SLNX change policy, because by default, when we enable this feature for all volume types, it, there is a potential to introduce some breaking changes. So having this uh, additional feature gate, and <clears throat> which allows you to configure this SLNX change policy in your pod, allows you to opt out of using mount option for SLNX relabeling. <clears throat> so um, that could improve uh, your performance of pod startup and whatnot. Another thing we are doing is that because it has potential of breaking your pod, we want to emit matrix and we want to emit events when there's a potential that, okay, two pods are using same volume but with conflicting SLNX labels, then we want to inform both the pod authors that, okay, your pod may have errors. So that's something uh, we are introducing in 132. By the way, just a show of hands, how many of you are using SLNX on, the, on your uh, OpenShift, or sorry, Kubernetes clusters? OK. So yeah, if you have any questions about it, please talk to me, Jan, or us after the talk. <clears throat> so this is a brief a table of like what could potentially break. I don't want to get into too much detail of it, but essentially, like if, you, if there's a potential that your pod will be broken once the SLNX mount feature becomes default, then you should get matrix. You should get alerts. And uh, it will be documented to help you guide through this process. And uh, yeah, <coughs> sorry. And uh, obviously, if you don't want to use this feature, you can, again, change uh, opt out of this by setting the SLNS change policy to recursive so that it goes back to previous behavior. This feature, the new SLNX uh, as a mount feature also opens up use cases that were not possible before, which is read write many, as you can see. You can now mount same volume on two different nodes with two different SLNS contexts, and they both pods will work, which was previously not possible at all. So it unlocks some new features that will be interesting. And uh, <clears throat> another feature that we have been working in 132 is moving volume group snapshot to uh, beta. And uh, this is uh, mostly out of tree feature, and it introduces. Into introduces these three new API types, volume group snapshot, volume group snapshot content, volume snapshot class, and it allows you to specify a selector and take the snapshot of all the volumes that match the selectors together and know when they're ready to use and, consume, uh, and use the snapshot. So if you're interested in this feature, please talk to uh, Zing and, uh, or, or in the, on Slack. So. And uh, yeah, one more feature we are moving to GA in uh, 132 is uh, uh, when you scale down stateful set, uh, currently the PVCs that was created for this, the pod, backing pod is left, or delete the stateful cell, so PVCs are left. So this uh, new feature, persistent volume claim retain po uh, retention policy, allows you to configure the behavior of uh, of what happens to PVCs when you scale down the stateful set, what happens to the PVC when you delete the stateful set, whether they're retained or whether they're, or whether they're deleted. So this could be useful for folks using stateful set. Um, some of the features that we have been working towards, which are in various stages of design and prototyping that we are quite not shipping in 132, 
uh, is one of them is the supporting um, volume expansion through stateful set. So currently, if you're using stateful set, the only way to expand uh, the volume is expand each PVC individually, which could be tedious, actually. You might have to take down the workloads. It depends. So there has been a consistent demand to allow users to expand all the persistent volumes that are in use by stateful set by directly editing the stateful set claim, uh, stateful set template. So that's a, that's a, it's a difficult feature, but we have been working on designing this. Hopefully in 133 we'll have alpha, alpha version of it. Another feature that we have been working on is like combining various sidecars, like attacher, resizer, provisioner, into a single sidecar. Uh, it's tedious to maintain all these different sidecars, uh, bump them, fix CVEs, and uh, all, all sort of things. And then uh, merging them into one uh, process will also allow us to reduce CPU and memory footprint of all the ext all these ext uh, sidecars because you know they can sh use the shared informer and whatnot. And uh, one more feature we have we have a proposed design in 132 which couldn't quite make it is the making CSI node allocatable property mutable. Uh, if you use volumes, you know that on AWS, GCE, or other cloud providers, there's a limit of how many numbers volumes you can attach to a node. So CSI node allocatable property has, it, it, it has a count that uh, each node uh, tells the scheduler how many volumes could be attached to this node. And, and based on that, scheduler decides whether to schedule a part on that node or not. But on many cloud providers, it, the, the value can change based on ENIs attached to the node or GPUs sometimes attached to the node. So we are making the Allocate, uh, allocatable property of a CSI node mutable and making sure that scheduler can see the change and dynamically adjust the limit as it changes. So this will allow the system to be more accurate, less parts will be stuck in container creating state, and uh, yeah. Uh, one more thing we are working on is the storage capacity scoring, which allows you to uh, score the PVC based, uh, score the nodes based on available capacity. So that could be useful for folks. And uh, as you know, we have been doing entry to CSI migration. At this stage, I believe like uh, most cloud provider-based drivers have been migrated to CSI. We are, we, we are hoping that we'll migrate uh, post -work, uh, Portworx driver from entry to CSI in 133. Uh, as all storage vendors and our users are using CSI more and more. We are seeing less use of entry drivers. So we have, we are in process of deprecating and removing the entry storage drivers we used to ship. So these are the list, this is the list of drivers that we have removed from entry. And one of the drivers that has been deprecated, not yet removed, is Git repo driver. We are hoping it will be removed in quarter four of 2025. And uh, I spoke with folks and they're interested in getting involved in and, and helping us. That'll be that'll be great for Kubernetes community, for storage community. So we have the six storage page here and we have a bi-weekly meeting every Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific, Pacific time. And then we have issue tri tries meeting where we discuss all the whatever issue that has been raised in Kubernetes against storage at 10 a.m. Pacific time every Wednesday. Then we have some sub-project meeting uh, for container object storage, CSI, data protection. We have a mailing list that you can join. We have uh, three different uh, Slack channels that you can join where you can ask us questions that you might have. And these are the resource page for which you can use for uh, yeah for getting more information or reading documentation that's that's all uh, we had thank you